Hello and welcome to a special video from the Orange Football Podcast. I'm Craig Savage. With me as always is Daniel Cody and Charlie Betts. Here we're about to discuss something that brought up from a tweet from Stan Collymore uh, after the Aston Villa played Liverpool in the FA Cup third round where Aston Villa first team had to self-isolate and the uh, under-18 side played against Liverpool's first team and they did not disgrace themselves. They lost 4-1. But however, there was 1-1 to it at one point and they fully deserved it. So Stan Collymore's tweet read out after the end of the game these boys could play 100 under 23 games and not get anywhere near the education they'll get tonight. Bring back the reserves. Get pros not in the first team squad playing with talented kids. 3 p.m. Saturday kickoffs at the stadium so fans can go watch the, so fans can go when the first team is away, like we used to. So uh, we thought about this and we kind of agree. Um, so Cody, uh, the, the reserve fold ended in 2012. Do you think we should go back to it? Well, in simple terms, yes. But there's a, a few different ways to get around that. There are pitfalls. We've got to bear that in mind. And there was a, a lot of talk about why it had been done initially with the view of the FA getting England to win. The, I think it was the 2024 Euros? By 2024? Yeah, I, I thought it was, a, it was a 2022 World Cup. Oh, so in two years, we can scrap it if it hasn't worked. So that's a good <laughs> sign. Um Obviously, it's led to a lot of things such as the EFL trophy and bits like that with under-21 teams, which we'll have to move on about. And this little B-team conversation keeps cropping up. But generally, I agree with that. I'm sure you'll ask questions about the reasons. But for me, yes, in a nutshell, I think it is the right thing to do. Charlie, uh, they brought it in. Do you think it's more of a financial gain to boost the Premier League rather than being about a doldrum and saying it's reserves? Well, the issue I have is that with the Premier League one, if your first thing inverted commas, gets relegated out of the Premier League, your reserve team gets relegated out of the, the whatever you want to call it, under-23 league, etc. So for me, I think it's a bit of a false sort of thing, really. Then you're essentially playing friendlies, aren't you? Because you might have the best under-23 team in the country, but if your first team finishes bottom of the Premier League, it's irrelevant. Do you know what I'm getting at? Like, so, so for me, I don't, I don't like it one bit. I think you should definitely go back to reserve team football. And the reason I say that is it's one of the few things that us as grassroots footballers can relate to is that transition from youth football to adult football and it, it is a, it's a massive steep learning curve it's probably the best football education you'll get so it's one of the few things we can relate to if I had to spend the next seven or eight years after leaving school playing in against people of a similar age I don't think that I would have got as many clubs as I moved on to no, I'm joking. I don't think I'd have had the there's much enjoyment out of the game you learn so quickly you learn little tricks and stuff like that so for me the reserve league is so important and I was genuinely sort of disappointed when they got rid of it in the first place so we'll break down Stan Collymore's tweet. And um, obviously it starts with, you can play 120, 100 under 23 games. But are, are clubs using that as a strength rather than send, send the players out on loan codes? Well, I think you're absolutely right on that. I mean, some of the, the general stats in terms of ups and downs, I'll keep it simple because they're huge numbers over eight years and I will mess most of them up. And I don't want to be one of those people. So in terms of ups, you could argue it's worked because Premier League players making their debut from academies has gone up. But the up flip side of that is that Premier League academies are stockpiling players. So the amount of players moving from 18 or 19, there was one in the Derby game today, as we're recording this against Chorley in the FA Cup, who had moved from playing first team football at South End to our Derby's under 23s. So again, you're benefiting the elite two divisions, which let's be honest, the Premier League and the Championship are now becoming standalone pretty much. And the lower league teams and then losing first team players playing against men who are then going back to playing against under 23s. And that education as a sort of chronological system just doesn't make sense. So in essence, and in answer to your question, it benefits the Premier League teams because they're stockpiling some of the best youngsters and taking them from first teams at other places. Ethan Ampadu at Chelsea playing first team football at Exeter and now he's sitting playing what? Five games at Sheffield United so far this season. Barely kicked a ball. Went to Germany, of course, but at Chelsea, not had a look in. They've just stockpiled him. And it's just becoming a money-making exercise for the top clubs with the biggest academies. And that's the bit, I think, for us, particularly as lower league football fans, that we probably struggle with the most. Charlie, uh, moving on, obviously, you said get pros, not playing in the first-team squad, playing with the tiny kids. Um, it it kind of gets on the recognised where first-team players, that obviously, they come back from injury and... You just, they just play the under-23 game and that's it. Um, do you think the, pro, the pros are benefiting as well as much as the under-23 players? Well, yeah, because, I mean, to be honest, I, as far as I'm aware, and correct me if I'm wrong in the comments below, I think you'll have four over-23s in those matches. You know, I think it's three outfields on the team, isn't it? 
there you go. So yeah, exactly that. So it's not it's not a lot. And but in terms of a pros development, in fact, we spoke to just for a few interviews, Alan Jenkins recently, and he said that his biggest education was when he was like 15 playing against in the reserve league. It was against pros who had come back from injury or had just signed, were trying to get match fit. And so it's good for the young lads. It's also good for those older pros because you're not going to get that competitive nature when you're just playing against teenagers. If, if I'm, for example, and I'm using uh, examples off the top of my head, if you take a Luton player, just say Danny Hilton, for example, he might get okay, a bit of a run out against a 19-year-old from Charlton Athletic. Or imagine he's playing um, a different team. I'm trying to think of a centre half. Someone from Norwich, uh, an experienced centre half from Norwich, who's coming back from injury at the same time. They're both going to get more out of that than an older head playing against the younger ones. You know what I'm getting at? If you've got two pros who are coming back from injury or trying to get fitness up, for me, I think it, it's it's what's the iron sharp on iron in that sense. The better quality of players you're playing against at any time is going to make you a better player. So for me, the reserve league is a bit of a dud. And the good thing that I liked about the old reserve league. Was that there was a uh, uh, you you played against teams in your own right. If you had a good reserve team, you played against the best reserve teams. Now you're relying on how your first team getting on. And for me, that's that's criminal. Um, yeah, because I think like the system of obviously, obviously from the top of the game, it was obviously they have the reserve division, and and now they change it to the develop like the development size or whatever, whatever. But do you, they brought it down to non-league level, and do you feel that's right, Coach? Well, no, because sort of non-league teams are particularly, I mean, this pandemic shone a light on it, really, is that so many non-league teams are having to sign new players two, three months on non-contract terms. It's sort of how non-league football has survived in most places. So to then have situations where these people can't get fitness or can't play games for two or three months, because they're relying on a bare 16 or 17. They haven't got a 40-man academy. They've got 16 or 17 under 23s if they've got a side. And if they've got four players isolating, they then can't play a development game. It wouldn't be affected by a reserve game. So it produces scheduling issues as well, but it shouldn't be down that far, in my opinion. I've, it, it shouldn't exist at all, to be quite frank for me, but in, at that level, it just makes no sense at all. And that's been proven. You've seen the amount of sides. I mean, even like the likes of Birmingham in the championship and that, who have announced they're scrapping their under-23 team because they can't afford it. I think Gary McSheffrey said the same at Doncaster when we spoke to him. He was working with the under-23s. They scrapped it. He's now working with under-16s. But what that's going to lead to at a lot of those clubs, and Luton's one of them that's not been able to set up an under-23 side, is you've got this massive gap between under-18s and first-team football. And it's either the odd few who can go out on low. You've got a lot of players who are sitting there and barely playing. You then get much weaker sides in the Carabao Cup if you're lower down in the EFL Trophy. If you're further up in the FA Cup, which we've seen a few times... It, it's just all become a bit of a mess, really. And it's a bit of a sad state to see football in. I know we talk about the top level, but even then at reserve level or development level, it's just had a really negative impact, in my opinion. Um, I'm just going to pick on one club. And it's not a dig out of this one club. But obviously, Brentford scrapped their development side, the reserve side, and they created Brentford B. But it's weird because I don't think they actually play competitive games. And Do you think that they're actually benefiting from, like, from youth players building themselves up to the first team, Charlie? No, I mean, we all know ourselves. And again, I don't want to keep going making it about us as grassroots footballers, but it's one thing we can relate to. A, a non-competitive game, you never learn as much, you never get as much out of it, a, a fitness aside possibly, as what you do playing a competitive match. If you ask any player, whether it be grassroots on a Sunday morning, all the way up to the, probably the Premier League, I'd argue, would you rather play a league match where there's three points at stake or next round of the cup or uh, 90 minutes against Chelsea's B team just so you can get you know, a bit of experience, get a bit of minutes under your belt? You're obviously always going to choose that competitive environment, but... That competition, there's tons of studies about sports science, about it. that competition leads to improvement in performance. It leads to improvement in skill acquisition and development. Just doing stuff for the sake of it, you know, it, it, you, you're, you're not going to progress as a footballer. So for me, it's counter, counterproductive. I just wanted to touch really quickly, I, you know, I'm not plugging interviews, I genuinely not, but we you know, spoke to Richard Paquette a while back. And he said the number of chances he got when he was playing under 18s football, for someone like him who was a fairly prolific striker, was massive. Went up to the first team, you know, three chances in a game. And if you don't take them, you're out of the squad. And the point I'm making is, is that transition, that re reserve team, is that bridge between the two. And to have a hat full, if you're a talented youth player, having a hat full of chances, or you take it as a midfielder, having loads of time on the ball, to then go straight into a first, game, first team game where it's the complete opposite of that, you need that bridge in between. And for me, that's what reserve team football was, because it's a mix of both. It's a mix of some of the youth players, and it's a mix of some older, older pros and experienced pros. So you've got that good transition. And for me, that must lead to a better arc of development of a player, a better transition from under 18s to first team football. But that seems to have been lost unless you're part of the, the 20 elite in the Premier League, which is something we're not obviously uh, too advocating too much for. So do, do you think that obviously from the non like, uh, grassroots non-league thing where they have reserves, reserve teams, 
like well, well mine to be honest but mm. um as they're they're benefiting from playing adult football do you obviously do you think they're benefiting more down that, that, that period, uh, end of the pyramid than they are at the top um well yeah i mean to be honest i spent a long, a long time playing for reserve teams and it still gives you that competitive environment you're playing in the league if you'd have said to me unfortunately charlie you can't make the 16 man score for the first team this saturday but we've got a friendly against uh i don't know Burke Camps did um, reserves, but it's not the reserves. It's just enough, the lads who didn't make their first team. You might as well just get a supporters team and do it that way if you're going to do that. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it, everyone wants to play competitive football. I mean, the only way I can sum this up is competitive football leads to better performance, leads to better development of footballers. And that's that's a scientific, there's so many studies about that. So why are you trying to negate that, get rid of that, and then still try and palm it off as, you know, oh, we're, it's all about development, it's all about growing the future of English football. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, Coach, as you're a season ticket holder, this next question is for you. Um, he, San Cuomo says uh, Saturday 3 p.m. at the stadium, so fans go when the first team are away. So if, obviously you can't say, for example, Luton were playing uh, Millsville at the Riverside. You know, it's a long way to go. and You might not want to go. But the reserves are playing at Cameron Road. Where Do you think that would benefit clubs more because they're getting at least this well considering there's a pandemic going on once it's obviously we've passed this uh this pandemic and fans are allowed to return to stadiums do you think that obviously clubs will need to earn some money do you think that will be a benefit sir it's a huge benefit and speaking from my point of view specifically craig as you've asked growing up i couldn't afford to be a season ticket holder and my family couldn't afford to me to be a season ticket holder what we used to do quite a few lads from schools like in half terms and things like that is they used to do the reserve games on Tuesday at two or three o'clock in the stadium. And if you weren't a season ticket holder, it was like two or three quid to get in. And we used to go and watch them when there was four or five big names on the team sheet. They were coming back from injury. So it was like one season, the season we went into administration where we signed about 80 over 30s. Um, I was going to watch a reserve game. There's Paul Furlong and Paul Pesky-Solido up front. You've got, you've got like 900 EFL games between them. And... You can't replace that as a like, as a youngster watching football. I'm playing on a Sunday. I can't afford to go and watch the first team, but that's a chance for me to see seasoned professionals and to enjoy football still. Yes, it's not quite the same with uh, obviously like a thousand people in the stadium rather than ten, but it's such an opportunity for young people to watch football. We've it's a completely different debate, but you've seen how much people are getting priced out at different levels before this pandemic. Of course, it's a great way to make football accessible for people as well in the community, and. It, there's so many ways it's a shame. There's a couple of tiny benefits we'll get to later, but for me, I think we're we're roundly in agreement for the first time in a while. Uh, yeah, we are actually. We, uh, Charlie. Obviously, from a, from a playing point of view, is obviously if the game was on at three o'clock on Saturday, for example, the reserves were at Kenilworth Road. They were playing. They were playing Watford reserves, for example. Obviously, um, from a playing point of view, if, if, there, if there's a good crowd there, surely that, that is something you need to learn as well. Yeah, it's nice. Oh, sorry, go on. No, it's just to get used to. Right? If you're going to be right way back in the, right way into the first team, you've got to go, get used to the crowd. So well, that will obviously be a benefit to them as well. Well, yeah, it sounds like I'm plugging interviews and I'm genuinely, genuinely not. But we spoke to a couple of lads who, you know, played in the Irish League and played first team football at other clubs. But two of them, their favourite game was when they played, I, admit, I know this isn't quite the same, but they played an old firm reserve derby, so Celtic Rangers, and it was like 25,000 people there. Obviously, I know those grounds hold 50, 60,000, whatever they are. They said that was their best experience, and actually, that's, your money can't buy that. Now, I'm not saying every reserve game is obviously going to get 20,000. It's not. But you use an example of Luton Watford. You know, if Luton were away that day and you had Luton reserves versus Watford reserves, I reckon you'd get a sizable number of fans there, obviously, if you're allowed, a sizable number of fans there that you wouldn't normally get at another reserve game or another reserve game or anything like that. So for me, I think it's an experience that younger lads can't buy, but also it gives a chance for, for those older pros, those lads who are coming back from reserve team football, the motivation and the, and the enthusiasm to keep going. And we've been injured. We know what it's like. Sometimes it's bloody hard, particularly even at local football, if you've been injured and you're sat on the bench for the first team, you're not getting a game, et cetera, et cetera, or whatever team you're playing for. You know, it's, it's tough. Whereas if you're playing in an environment where you're still getting fans coming along, and as a kid, I mean, what more inspiration do you want? Like you say, you joke about Paul Furlow or Pes Paul Pesky Salido, but actually, that's stayed in your memory. That's an inspiration. If you had children now coming to watch, I'm only using Luton as an example, you know, who had, I don't know, uh, Glenn Ray and uh, Danny Hilton have just come back from injury and they're both in the reserve team. That's a massive inspiration for a seven, eight, nine year old, you know, to keep them in the game and keep them interested in the club. So for me, there's very little um, negatives to it, apart from Craig, where probably you're going to go in a minute, which is about the effect you might have on the local game. You want your, your local team, obviously, the highest local team. 
to watch them as even as much as possible if it's like a reserve game or first team. But the, the downside if you're going to go and watch the reserve team is the, lo- the local team, non league teams around it, for example, where we live in Luton. Obviously, you've got your Dunstable Towns, your ASA Dunstable, your Crawley Greens. Um, they're not going to benefit from their code. Well, they're not. I, I guess to an extent they're not. They used to do little schemes and things like that that made it a bit easier, but I can't see with the current situation, the higher echelons of the game are in, that that's ever going to come back, even if reserve team football did. Uh, it, it's There are risks, as you've said. They're, they're not perfect systems in place, but I, I don't know if it doesn't benefit them on the pitch later on down the line, because potentially if you've got reserve team football back and it's more accessible... Do you then have more players who are getting fit and ready to go out on loan? Do you then have more youngsters who are ready to play senior football earlier on? Do you then have younger players who maybe aren't quite ready for reserve football who then go and get back the old youth development loans? Like Luton used to do loads of them with like Hitch in town and that. And they basically, bar one or two every few years, have dried up now. So there might be a benefit for them on the pitch, but I completely accept that for you, for example, if there's not a Luton game I can get to at the moment, I'd come watch you guys play at home because it's around the corner from me if Luton Reserves were playing at home and it was free for season ticket holders, of course I'd go there, which benefits yeah. them and not you. So I understand that point as well, but it, it will benefit the smaller clubs on the pitch as well. So for me, it's a 50-50 on that one. Charlie, obviously with Reserve football pretty much out of the equation now, they're trying to use B teams in. And obviously we spoke in the past about B teams and and obviously try and get them into the league, which I, I totally disagree on because there's too many teams in the English pyramid to actually put bits of them in. Um, but do you, if they did do that, B teams, do you think B teams should actually be non-league? Um, I think a B team is just a reserve team, though. You know, I think if you have that fluidity between the two, bin off the name B and just call it reserve, but just play other B teams in a competitive environment. Essentially, if you want B team football, just play against other B teams, but put points at stake or put, put cup at stake or something but do, like do, that. But do you, you think that? But do you think they're actually benefiting from that? Like, like, forget B teams for example. Like even under twenty three, do you think they're actually benefiting from playing against other under twenty three sides? Well, no, that's what we've sort of been saying from the beginning. No, I don't think they are, because I don't think they're getting the, the transition from for, from youth football to first team football. And it's a bit of a shock. And Dan's already alluded to how many players you know make it, maybe don't make it, etc. The, the progression they make. So for me, no, I don't think it is working. You can, I mean, you can call it different names, but if you're just going to... If you take the age limit off, it's reserve team football. You can call it a B team, you can call it a red team, whatever you want to call it, I don't care, but it's essentially reserve team football. And I think the quicker we get back to that, the quicker actually you'll see an improvement in the, you know, the, the standard of players coming back from injury, the standard of players you know, making through rank, ranks to the first team. You know, it's too, it's too easy for lads to just sit in under 23s at a big club not go out and play against good, hard and pros. You know, you speak to pros about it. When they go and play reserve team football, they get put up in the air by a 34-year-old set half. You remember that and you learn a lesson from it. You're not going to get that kind of experience if you're playing under 23 teams every week. Well, the one, sorry, Craig, to jump in. The one mm-hmm. thing I would say on Charlie's point there about being kicked up in the air by a 34-year-old is one of the, the slight benefits of development leagues is I know soft tissue injuries haven't really changed, but long-term injuries have been down by about 6% in under 23 players playing in those leagues. So... There is a slight benefit on the injury front. You could argue some of the season pros maybe are a little bit firmer than they could be. And maybe some of the younger players, they haven't fully developed. They're not ready for that stage of football. But I guess that's down to a, a coach to decide. But there there are slight risks as well. I know we don't want to admit them because we're probably all very big advocates for the, for reserve team football. But that is one of them we do have to admit. Well, well yeah. But just think about it that way because... They want to play, actually play football, as in like they want to pass it along, the, like start from the back, pass it along. And you, you don't get like Vinnie Jones nowadays, who just completely go through the back of someone like that as well. But you will get it in non-league. That, but that's, that's that's football. That's how it's different from up to the top to the down to the bottom. But um, just want to go for one more question on codes. Um, Derby, uh, they played Chorley in the FA Cup. They lost 2 0. They didn't have their first team squad out. They had their under 18s. Do you think the under 18s benefited more playing a team like Chorley, uh, and, and not, not in a disrespectful way, but obviously playing an, an adult game in the FA Cup, than they probably would playing Burn Albion under 18s this weekend? Oh, without doubt. It comes back to that original question, doesn't it? Is they're going to get more of a footballing experience from that? It's always been the balance, and it's been this sort of FAV club thing, isn't it? The club thing, probably for reserve football, is that you will 
get more competitive action. Your players will be ready for first team football. The FA side of it and the under 23 development side is we want the players to be better technically because that was a problem we had in our country for so long. And if we play an under 23 league and there's less pressure on them, there's less physicality in the league, they're going to develop more technically. But so much of the game, particularly in England and particularly at the elite levels, is played between the ears and physically, isn't it? And unfortunately, that won't change anytime soon in England. And in most adult leagues, to be fair, we say in England we've got an ultra-physical team. It doesn't really work that way because in European games, there's plenty of England teams that have been out-muscled in games. So it's a hard one to understand. I think, personally, reserve team football is the way forward. I think those players for Derby will have got such an experience, the same for Aston Villa, from playing in men's football at those stages. And the sad thing is, as Charlie and you have alluded to, is those kids previously were getting that experience. And yes, it might have been at one or two percent of a technical loss later down the line. But if it gives you the mentality to become a top player, surely that's not a negative thing. But I guess that's a debate that will rage on for many years because I don't, unfortunately, despite my wishes, see it changing anytime soon. Charlie, one final question from me is, obviously, the, the B teams are in the EFL trophy. Do you think they actually gain anything from this? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, that's, that's a, you could do a whole episode on that. And I think we, we probably did a while back if. The whole B team's in the EFL Cup thing. It doesn't. It makes zero sense to me because what I, all I'll say to sum it up, I won't go on a long debate, look at the numbers of people who go to watch those games. That, for me, speaks volumes about the, the worthwhileness of uh, as an entertainment industry for us as fans, but also as players. The players pick up on that, surely. You know, if you're a pro and you're going out and you're used to playing in front of 9,000 people and you go to an EFL Cup game against, I don't know, for our, I'm going to say Newcastle under 23s, and you've got 600 people there, you know yourself. It's going to affect your performance. I, you know, I refuse to, to believe it doesn't. So for me, look at the numbers of people going to watch it. That sums it all up for me, the appetite for under-23 teams or B teams playing against football league teams. But doesn't the, need to have a place. The thing with that, Charlie, is that because they're not playing reserve team football all season or competitive fixtures against men, is they're not as prepared for it. So that's why no under-23 sides are reaching a final or semi because if they were playing reserve team football all season, you could argue it probably would be quite competitive if they were in the EFL trophy and it would work alongside that. But on its own, in isolation, it's three games a season. They're playing 20-odd games against under-23s and then suddenly three games against men. And you can't prepare for it that way. And that's why reserve team football is the perfect bridge, like you've both said. So, well, yeah, because yeah, uh, yeah, it's like three games and you could be out in the first two games and then it's, and then it's rendered pointless. Hmm. But... That is, that is our discussion on reserve team football from Stan Corey Moore's tweet. Do you agree with us? Do you disagree with us? Let us know in the comment section down there. We can have a little bit of discussion down there. Give this video a like, subscribe to the Honest Football Podcast. You can follow us on Twitter at Honest Football Free. We've got championship predictions. We've got manager specials. We have also got interviews with fellow pros. And we'll see you next time.